Ruiz. Welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by FunkinStuff.net. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I am your host, Scott Dr. G.X. Goldfine, musicologist, creative arts journalist, and multimedia pro. Whether you're watching the video version of this show or the audio-only podcast version, I thank you so much for your continued interest and support in this show. If you enjoy this programming, there are several ways to help support Truth and Rhythm, as well as contribute to further enhancements and expansion, plus get some sweet perks and rewards in the process. First, subscribe to the Funkin' Stuff channel on YouTube, which is where Truth and Rhythm lives, and be an advocate by spreading the word among fellow funk, jazz, and R&B music lovers. Second, join Truth and Rhythm's new membership program through Patreon, which features three tiers for truth believers, truth seekers, and truth crusaders. You can also submit a direct donation to the cause anytime at funkinstuff.net. At that site, which is loaded with awesome content, you can also purchase the book, Everything's on the One, The First Guide to Funk. Shop for official Truth and Rhythm and Funk and Stuff merchandise, and use the Amazon links for all of your online purchases, which allocates a percentage to this show. Sponsorship opportunities are available as well. Contact me directly at scottg at funkinstuff.net. For those of you who go the extra step in supporting the show, you have my heartfelt gratitude for allowing us to continue to shine the light on those special artists whose quest is to find truth in rhythm. I am thrilled to welcome to the Truth and Rhythm Mothership longtime former Commodore's bassist and composer Ronald LaPred. From 1970 to 1986, he set down the rhythmic foundation for one of the greatest and most popular funk, R&B, and pop bands of all time. During that period, the group recorded more than a dozen successful albums, at their peak having four straight reached number one R&B, and that included 23 top R&B, uh, top 25 R&B singles, and 16 top 40 pop hits. Among those songs and other favorites were I Feel Sanctified, Machine Gun, Slippery When Wet, This Is Your Life, Sweet Love, Give Me My Mule, Fancy Dancer, Just To Be Close To You, High On Sunshine, Brick House, Easy, Zoom, Funky Situation, Too Hot To Trot, Three Times A Lady, Sail On, Still Old Fashioned Love, Lady You Bring Me Up, and Oh No. Wow. Since the late 1980s, LaPred has lived in New Zealand, where he comes to with us today. Ronald, how are you? Thank you for joining the show. Uh, I'm great. I, I That sounds like a wonderful person you just introduced. <laughs> yeah, indeed, indeed. Yeah, it can be a little overwhelming. I know sometimes when it's all put together like that, it's like, wow, right? I know, I know. It was, it was like a dream, you know? It was like a dream. We would go into rehearsal, and we'd, we'd do the song, Slippery When Wet, and uh, we had no idea that it would affect people as it did you know so we were lucky yeah, yeah. well I, you know you're officially the farthest uh we've gone to do the show we've done a number of shows uh from europe but never wow. uh to down under in that area so uh glad you're coming in nice and clear and it's so indeed. good to have you today indeed 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 yeah uh, you know new zealand new zealand is now the, probably the film capital of the world so there's okay. a lot of stuff going on down here yeah, the um, Peter Jackson, right? He's from yeah. there, and yeah, they yeah. he, he started it all off. That's right. <laughs> you haven't seen any hobbits down there, have you? No, I try to stay away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I try to stay away from the hobbits. Yeah. <laughs> well, mm -hmm. man, you've been down there for like three decades now, right? Yeah, about thirty-four years up in here. Wow. 
Uh, I came, I came for a two month vacation. I came for a two month vacation. And, and uh, when I got here, I stayed for approximately four years before I went back to USA. And when I went back to USA, it was much too much, too much, too much. I mean, America, the, the grocery store is big as the supermarket here, you know. So it was it was a big change, big change. Yeah, that's um, extreme out in the country, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. Indeed. So, uh, before we uh, jump into uh, the questions, I do want to say special thanks out to Eric Parker, who helped connect us, and that was much yeah. appreciated. So thank you, Eric. Yeah. Can you tell everybody, you know, um, how you first got into music before the Commodores? Wow. I... Uh... I, I'm, of course, from Tuskegee, and in Tuskegee, my mother was a hairdresser. She was a beautician, and her co-worker had a son who had a band, and this, this son had booked uh, an engagement, and he told the people that he had a full rhythm section, and uh, he had everything except a keyboard player, so I was like, 16 years old, he asked me to sit behind the piano because he had heard me plucking, you know, at home, he heard me plucking. He said, you just sit behind the piano so that I can show the man that I got a full rhythm section. And uh, I sat there for an hour and a half and he paid me $75 and I didn't play anything. I didn't play, I just sat there. And uh, when he paid me the $75, I said, maybe something in this music thing, you know, so I better learn how to play this piano. And I played keyboards with a band called the Corvettes in Tuskegee for, oh, maybe four or five years. No, three, four years, because I was at high school. And uh, as I started playing music, I started playing the tuba, the sousaphone, the trumpet, the trombone, uh, French horn. And then I got a music scholarship to Mississippi for a applied music. I had to play in the marching band and in the concert band, but I majored in electrical engineering. So uh, I, I started playing and then uh, one day Lionel Richie and Thomas McFerry walked up to me and said that uh, their bass player had been drafted into the army for the Vietnam War. And did I know a bass player? And of course I said, yeah, I'm the best bass player in town. Never had picked one up. <laughs> and we started, uh, they started rehearsal. I thought I'd go to rehearsal and they would show me some music. And then I'd have to read the music and play the bass. But they, they went and they put a record on and they said, this is the song that we're going to learn. And I don't have perfect pitch. I have relative pitch. So I'm always close to the note where it starts. And then I figured it out from that. And that's how I started playing bass guitar. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That reminds me a little bit of I had uh, James Alexander, the Barquets, on not long ago. And he got into that group also not ever ha pl having played the bass and basically yeah. learned on the job, you know? Yeah, James, James, that was my boy. Uh, I, I, we really got on. He was, uh, I thought he was a nice bass player. Stayed in the right place at the right time, you know. Ronald, what were your first impressions of uh, Thomas and Lionel when you first met them? You know, what kind of guys were they? Well, well, they were at Tuskegee Institute. They were at the university, and I was in the city. And there were maybe three or four bands there. They were called the Jays before they were called the Commodores. And uh, the bass player was the lead singer and the leader of the group. And uh, I mean, it, he left a pretty big footprint to feel when I, when I got in his place. But we were always competing with each other. My group, uh, the Corvettes, were competing with the Jays. And, and uh, so we knew each other. We knew each other. 
and and uh, but we had never worked together. We had, we had never worked together, and they 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 knew that I played keyboard. They they had no idea that I played bass. I didn't either, but we learned. <laughs> yeah. How how quickly were you able to progress on bass from there? Ooh, well, we when they when they asked me to come to rehearsal, I had a friend who had a bass guitar and an amplifier. I took his bass guitar to my house and I put on James Brown. Uh, uh, what was that? Cold sweat. Don't, don't, don't. And, and I learned that on the bass. And, and that was the only song that I knew to play on the bass. And when we went to rehearsal, they put on uh, Liar, Three Dog Night. And I had to, I had to learn that. And uh, after that, everything, everything I heard, I learned to play. Everything I heard. And then we started doing our own music. So most of my lifetime, all of the bass parts that I played, I made them up. You know, I never had to play anybody else's bass. I would listen to Larry Graham. I would hang out with James. I knew, I knew a lot of bass players, but I never had to play their music. So Ronald, when you came into the group, were the other members all in place at that point? Were you the last one to join the six? I was the last one. Uh, Andre Callahan was a drummer and Michael Gilbert was a bass player and they both got drafted together. They found Walter Orange before they found me. And uh, Clyde, was, Clyde was a drummer from Montgomery and he came in and he was playing and singing and carrying on and he was awesome. He was awesome. And at that time, Lionel Richie didn't want to sing. Mm -hmm. he, he would only sing one song in the show. And uh, we decided to say, okay, we don't want to be a band. We want to be a group. We want to entertain. We want to have uniforms. We want to dance. We want to sing. We want to do. So, and we said that the drummer, even though he was the singer, he couldn't be in the center of the stage out front. So we made Lionel Richie the singer, and he hated it. He was mostly a sax player at first, yeah. right? He yeah. was a sax player. He, he played saxophone, and William King played trumpet. And, I mean, we would light it up, you know. We would really light it up. And it was a lot of fun. We were young, weren't afraid of anything, had no problems, and it was just great, just great. Legend has it that the name was basically just picked out of a dictionary or something like that. Is that true? Accidentally, we took a dictionary and laid it on its side and let it fall open. And right next to commode was Commodore. <laughs> we could have been the commodes, but <laughs> we landed on Commodore and that's the way it was. Wow. <laughs> mm. Um. And, and early on, you guys opened for the Jackson 5, right? Yeah, we, we, uh, when, we, when we signed our contract with Motown, uh, Suzanne DePaz was a very dear friend to our manager, Benny Ashburn. And uh, she came to watch us play at the Lower Price Turntable on 58th and Broadway or something, uh, downtown in New York. And she said, okay, okay, we're going to take these boys on, on the road with a group of mine. And we said, okay. She said, you got 40 minutes on the stage and you got to be on time to get on and on time to get off. You can't go over 40 minutes. So we said, okay, we set the show, we worked, we rehearsed, we got everything, what we said, what we did, what we played, we had it all time. So that at 40 minutes, pop, it was over. We did, had no idea who we were working with. She said, just one of my groups. And I think the first show was in Syracuse, New York. And we went from Alabama to Syracuse and we got there and there was 
two foot of snow everywhere. You couldn't see anything. It was cold. We couldn't find where we were gonna gonna play. And we drove by the auditorium and we saw the billboard live, Jackson Five, special guests, Commodores. We just freaked out. We didn't know what to do. Jackson Five, I want you back. ABC, all of these things, all these little kids running around. And they wanted us to hurry and get off the stage so that the Jackson Five could come out. But we ended up working with them for about four years. Every, every place they went, Commodores went with them. And uh, that was really, Michael Jackson gave me my start and uh, big, big thing, you know, he put us on stage and they were playing 80, 90, 100,000 people. And we were the opening act. Well, wow, it's an interesting pairing, you know, especially in hindsight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was very interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, and later on, Michael stole a few of our ideas for uniforms too. <laughs> That's, I could see that. Yeah. <laughs> yes, indeed. Oh, uh, wow! So eventually, I guess you learned how to satisfy that youthful audience that they brought. Well, what 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 really happened is all of the kids had to be a comic. Uh, 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 they had to be with their parents and we were we were really entertaining the parents and the parents started liking the commodores and they started taking the music home and things like that and then they indoctrinated the kids to like it too so uh we went on and then one day I mean, after doing all of these fantastic things with uh, Jackson 5, we did a show in Des Moines, Iowa, and it was the Jackson 5 and the Osmond and Commodores. There were 180,000 people at the show, and they just went crazy. I mean, it was just something out of a fairy tale, you know, we, we, we couldn't believe it. Donnie Marie and, uh, and all of the Osmonds and Michael Jackson and Tito and, and Jermaine and, and then Lionel Richie and the Commodores. It was something to... Wow, it, they've probably never seen anything like that since in that part of the country. I don't um. think so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah. So were you guys, um, before you did your first record with Machine Gun, um, were you guys playing originals with the Jackson 5 opening or were you playing covers or what kind of stuff? Uh, we, were, we, were doing, we were doing our rendition of color covers. We would, we would take it and we had a little thing that we would commodorize, you know, we would put our little breaks in it and we do our little routines and do all of that. And then, and then, uh, but at the same time, Barry Gordy was putting us through his machine. You know, he had a he had a music production scene. He had the uh, Fabulous Funk Brothers. He had uh, Edwin Starr. He had all of the all of his producers, uh, Norman Whitfield, and and everybody. They would write the song, and then. Uh, Fabulous Funk Brothers would record it, and then they would bring the, the group in to sing on it. And we, we kept telling them, no, we want to play our own music. We want to do our own thing. And we had gone through everybody in the company. We had gone through everyone, Hal, Davis, everybody. We had gone through everyone trying to find a song. And they put us with uh, Pam Sawyer and Gloria, Jones, two of their writers, and uh, we did. Uh, we went to Muscle Shows and we recorded. Uh, Are you happy with what you got? Uh, you got a little fringy, and and uh, we played that on show with the Jack and Five. On the first tour, we went. Around USA, the first tour was 93 shows in 102 days. 
So we were working hard. And when we got to L.A., we saw Barry Gordy. Barry Gordy said, okay, we're going to let you all record your own music. Go to the studio and do something. And Mylon Williams had this song that we wanted to record, Machine Gun. And it, it took us... It took us almost three weeks to find, to get the instrument to make that sound. It took us three weeks to get that program and put into the studio so that we could do it. And then we did it. Barry Gordy got the song. He put it on red vinyl and he sent it out to all of his people around the world. And that red vinyl me make this song work. And it went to number one. Was there any pushback that it didn't have vocals? Uh, it we it didn't have it didn't have vocals, but we were a new group, and they didn't know that we had singers, you know. And at that time, at that time, uh, when they put the forty five out, they put a woman on the front of the cover because I think they didn't want everybody to know that the group was black mm -hmm. and it, because we didn't sound black and, and they put it out and they did it. And then when we put out the, the album, they saw the picture of the band and they said, oh my goodness, look at it. These, are, these boys are straight out of Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, it's, it was good. It was real good. And you were matched up with uh, James Carmichael right from that first album, right? No, James Carmichael came on maybe first album, Machine Gun album. Yeah. James Carmichael was there, yeah. But th that wasn't the first album. That was the first one that everybody knew about. We had gone, we had gone with uh, Willie Hutch. We had gone with, uh, what's the boy, War, Dun Dun. Everyone star. It was star. We'd been with him. We had been with Hal David, who was the producer for the Jackson Five. And uh, we told him, we don't need a producer. We need an arranger. We need someone to come in and, and take what we're doing and put it into the form of what records were. And then we met James Carmichael. And I think that was a marriage made in heaven then, you know, because he, he was from Gaston, Alabama. We're from Tuskegee. Uh, we, would bring him, we would bring him back to Alabama, and he would stay there with us for two or three months rehearsing and working the songs out and things like that. And he just got to be the seventh member, you know. Everything we did, we went through James Carmichael. Thank God for him, too. Yeah, I was going to say before you said it, that it sounds like he was the seventh member. That's right. He was the seventh member. And, and he, would, he was always very gentle, but he knew his music. You know, he knew his music. He could, he could hear anything. He told us after we put out three times a lady, he said the song was so interesting. He said the song was so interesting. If he had paid attention, it was a waltz. Thanks for the time that you gave me. He said, I would have never put that song out if I realized that it was a waltz. <laughs> but it slipped under the cover. Um, man, uh, I Feel Sanctified was probably, uh, well, Machine Gun I heard too, but I Feel Sanctified was the one that just really first captivated me for the group because it was so funky. Um, and it just really set, I think, that template for that sound in the funk side of things that the mm. Commodores just worked like crazy. Um, do you remember actually laying that down and, you know, that experience? Do I remember? Oh, we did that song. I feel, yeah, I feel sanctified. And, and, and when, it, when it started, I think we recorded that track maybe 115 times in the studio. Then we had about 115 takes of it. And after playing so long, your fingers get sore. And 
as my as my fingers got so I couldn't strike the guitar like this because it was so so. So I started hitting it like that. And that's how the pop was that that slap bass was, was born. I was just hitting it because we were gonna go back and do it again after I after we cut it and my fingers warmed up. But it fell in the in the groove so well that they kept the, the slap on the thing. Cal Harris, the engineer, took some things and enhanced it, but it was because my hand was so sore I couldn't pluck the string. Hmm. <laughs> well, when you mentioned plucking, I, I'm thinking, you know, of Larry Graham at that time and were were there who were a couple of bass players from that era that you really were uh, enamored with that was only one and you just called his name <laughs> that was only one i thought that uh i thought that that larry graham was always in the right place you know a lot of bass players marcus miller he he's hell of a bass player he can he can play all around everything but bass has to be in the right spot. You know, if it's in the right spot and it gets the bones to shake of a, of a human being, then you, you, you're really working it then. I have, seen, I have seen music go to Japan and they can't speak a word, but they understand the feeling of music. I go to Philippines, they don't speak a word of English but they feel that they got that feeling. Germany, Switzerland, Scotland, England, France. I mean, it, it, they don't understand what you say, but everybody feels the same way. Everybody get that feeling, you know, and it just lights you up. And I think that was, that was really what our asset was. Were there any other groups that you guys kind of looked at and you aspired to at that time? You know, were you looking at people like, I don't know, Earth, Wind & Fire or other bands and saying, you know, uh -huh. we kind of want to, you know, either be like them or surpass them or? <clears throat> groups. Uh, when, we were, when we were coming along, there were lots of groups. There was uh, Confunction. There was LTD. There was uh, Ohio Players. There was uh, there was Gap Band. Charlie Wilson. Whew. I mean these these people. They were doing it. You know they were they were making music. They were making songs. They had funk. They had they had a, a lot of togetherness. But we wanted to be. Bigger than Rolling Stones, bigger than the Beatles. We wanted to. We wanted to be that way, you know. Uh, we 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 enjoyed playing in nightclubs, but we thought we needed bigger space. And if if we had a bigger space, then we had to have a bigger show. So we started doing costumes, and we started doing. Uh, in 1978, in the USA, Commodores had a tour on the road that had 18 semi 40 foot long trucks with the stage and the show on it. We had 72 people, roadies and people in the production. We, we, tried, to, we tried to make it bigger than life. You know, we tried to. I, I saw. I saw the tour. I, I was at the one. If you remember, at UCLA Poly Pavilion. Yeah, yeah, I was there. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah, but you know, we we would have exploding stages, and we would do it. Oh, used to be some of the funniest things you ever want to see. Thomas McClary, God bless him. He loves. He loves Jimi Hendrix, and we were playing, and and we had put some cotton on his guitar like a like a pad and he was going to run over to the side 
and uh, Rhodey was going to spray lighter fluid on the cotton. And he's playing his solo and he runs back to the left side and he's playing and he's doing it. And then he runs back over to where the roadie was. And the roadie was supposed to strike a match and put it on his guitar so it would burn. But while he was playing, he was shaking his guitar like this. And the roadie was squirting the lighter fluid, but he got on his uniform. And when he struck the match and put the match on the cotton, his whole pants leg lit up. Wow. And he went running out back at the stage. <laughs> Commodores were lying on the floor laughing. <laughs> we couldn't play another note. It was <laughs> the funniest thing. <laughs> Where was it? It was funny. It was, we were in someplace Dayton or Cincinnati or something like that, somewhere up in, up in the Midwest. And he did that, boy, we were no good after that. <laughs> <laughs> did, did, you, did you drop that from the show or keep doing it? Yeah, uh, we dropped the pad, yes. <laughs> we dropped the pad. And, and uh, he never wanted to do it again, no. I can see why. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man, but it used to be some funny stuff. We used to, and people didn't know anything would happen, you know, but it used to be funny. And Commodores had no game face. If something happened funny, everybody laughed. <laughs> everybody laughed. It was something else. Well, you know, having been at that one show that year at UCLA, I mean, I can say that the band's energy was just unbelievable. I mean, mm. so much... Uh, intensity and and just having a great time and just you know really really energetic yeah we would we would uh commodores i think i think the the road to their success was every day at nine o'clock in the morning if we were not on the road touring or anything every day we'd go into rehearsal at nine o'clock and we'd stay there from nine o'clock in the morning until two o'clock in the morning, every day. Mm. And and uh, when you when you when you spend that much time together, I know when the drummer is making a mistake. I know when somebody missed the word. We know how to cover it up before anybody gets gets air that something's happened. You know, and. That was the key to our success. That was, and Lionel Richie writing some great songs, you know, uh, <laughs> great song. Thomas McClary wrote some great songs. Marlon Williams wrote some great songs. I wrote some great songs. So, so I mean, you know, and it was in-house competition. It was in-house. Everybody was competing to try to get a song on the album. So we knew that we had to beat Lionel Richie or we had to beat Marlon Williams or we had, you know, and it, it, it made the album very, you know, add different kinds of music on it and things like that. And we got to be an album selling group rather than singles. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was just going to say that. Um, and yeah, just front to back, they were so consistently strong, those albums, um, and really started, I mean, Machine Gun was was strong, but really with Caught in the Act, to me, from that point on, it was just a whole another ball game. You guys were just so fully realized. And there yeah. was, you know, the great funk and the great ballads and just had everything. And mm -hmm. um, Slippery One Wet, I mean, I bugged out on that one. That was just an incredible <laughs> track, you know, and I, I thought it should have hit number one, pop, uh, whatever. Some people, you know, there were issues didn't play it, but, and then Wild Cherry had such a huge hit based on, you know, the Commodore's like template. That didn't seem right, but that's how yeah. it went. Yeah, that's how it went. Yeah, for sure. But that's all right. I taught, I taught them everything they know, Wild Cherry. <laughs> yeah, but there was some, there was, there was a lot of, good inspiration in those days for music, you know. Now, most people, most people say they don't like the rap music and, you know, it's not 
it's not up to that and it's not to this. But if you ever try to do it, you will find out how clever these young kids are. I mean, because uh, first off, as a musician, it is the most difficult thing to maintain that same groove all the way through the song. No changes, no highlights, no nothing, and still make it feel as though it changed. And these young kids, they're really on to it. I mean, they, they wouldn't know a note if it walked up to them and slapped them in the face, but they got that feeling and they got the, they, they got the technique to run in that computer and they can get it to do what they hear. And, and that's amazing to me. Well, and also hip hop and rap's built on funk anyway. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they, they, they start from funk. As a matter of fact, that's the only thing that's keeping me going. They go back to Commodore stuff and they, they sample a lot of our music and most of it is mine that they sample. <laughs> most of it's mine. Yeah. That's great. Uh, as long yeah. as you get, as long as you get those residual checks and, and it's all about, uh, board, uh, we, don't, we don't do too bad. <laughs> yeah. We don't do too bad. Yeah. Good to hear. Good to hear. Indeed. Um, so, what uh, what are a couple of your favorite tracks or favorite memories in the studio with the band from the 70s? Wow. Now, my all-time favorite song for the Commodores, when we did it, when we did the song in the studio, it it just it just hit my my vibrating tone. And if I was sad. I listened to this song, it would pick me up. If I was happy, it would slow me down so that I could get focus and things like that. And the song was, uh, Why You Want to Try Me. Mm. Uh, and and uh, as it, it, when it got down to that, ooh, whoa, 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 then that was, that was bringing it home to me. Once I heard that part, I'm ready to go on stage and perform for the Queen of England. It doesn't matter who's out there, it's going to be a nice performance. It's going to be really nice. That thing, it always tuned me up. I don't know why. I, Brick House was nice. Easy was nice. Three Times a Lady was nice. But that Why You Want to Try Me, it was, it was just, it, it, it just struck, struck my soul. You know, I, I love that song. Mm. Is there a, another one, too, or is that... <laughs> Uh, I tell you, when uh, my wife and I was sitting in New Zealand, when we first went on to the first lockdown, when everything was going crazy and people all around the world were suffering and carrying on, we sat up on a, and I didn't, I didn't usually listen to the Commodores that much. We, we sat out on the patio and uh, we played the song, uh, Heroes. Mm. We played hero. And uh, for some reason, two years ago, I actually heard that song. And I was sitting there saying, what makes a man walks alone into battle? He's an angel of mercy for everyone. And, and uh, at that time, uh, Jacinda Ardoon just, she did the unthinkable. She closed New Zealand off to the world. She said, we're going to save this here. We're going we're gonna to take care of the people. And uh, I just started thinking, wow, you, uh, you never know who the hero is going to be until they step up. And at that time, she was the hero. She stepped up and she set the diagram for every country to save its people. And they eventually got on board, you know, and they started closing it down. They started stopping, stop people from going. But that song just resonates with me, the, the words to that song. And I think that just speaks so well to the timelessness of a lot of those songs, you know? Um, yeah. 
here we are so many years later and they're still just as relevant and poignant and sound great. Um, do you remember Ronald, what the original, uh, inspiration was for that particular song back then? Uh, it was, when was that? That was. It's like 1980 ish, right? And 1980 ish. Yeah. That was. Mm. Exact year. Here. Let's see. Was it, uh, was it 80? Was it 79? 80? It, well, you probably recorded in 79, but it came out in 80. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 79. Something was going on with, uh, Something was going on with with I think Muhammad Ali, and uh, he was he was uh, when was that that uh, he denounced his championship to be the heavyweight champion, and he said I'm not going to go to the Vietnam War. I don't want to do it. He said I don't want to do it. They didn't do anything to me, and then they they. They took his championship away for four or five years, and then they were giving it back to him. You know, they were giving they were giving him the opportunity to fight, and and uh, we knew Muhammad Ali, we knew Joe Frazier, we knew them. My manager was very close to him, and we had a little bit of insight as to what was going on. You know, a little bit. And I thought he stood up. It was it was really, I thought it was really heroic for him to take on the United States government and say, I'm not going to do that. Mm-hmm. So you never know where the hero comes from, you know. Yeah, you, well, you know. he was one of the all-time greats for sure. Yes, indeed. Um, the greatest, as he's known. Um, as he is, yep. I got to ask you about a couple of my personal favorites since I have you here. Um, and one, one that's, you know, really not on a lot of people's radar, but just to me is as funky as anything that the Commodores did is give me my mule. Um, <laughs> you know, that is just seriously funky. Um, and I don't think it was pushed as a single or anything like that, but uh, it was on the um, moving on al- album, right? Yeah. Moving yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, on the on the moving on album, uh, Motown was telling the Commodores that uh, we should move to California. We should move to California so that we could be readily at their disposal. And uh, all of the fellows wanted to do it. They wanted to move to California. They wanted to be that. And I told them, I said, look, I said, look. It is best for us to stay in Tuskegee where we, it's easy to be a big fish in a small pond. I say, but if you go to California, Lionel Richie is going to have his friends that's telling him, you don't need the rest of the band because you are the one that's writing the songs. They would tell Thomas McClary, his friends would tell him, oh, you don't need, you don't need the Commodores. You know, you're the guitar player. You're doing this. They, they, my friends would come and tell me, you know, you're the personality. You don't need them and that. So I told him, I said, look, the success to the Commodores is the fact that we are from Tuskegee, Alabama, population 8,000 people. There's, there's no competition. There's nobody trying to separate you. Nobody is trying to offer you a better contract than this and that and that and that. So they're not going to separate the group. I say, give me my mule. Let me stay in the countryside so that I can skinny dip if I want to. I can go do what I want to do. And nobody's going to ask me why you want to do that. They just allow it. You got your freedom, you, you got your space, and you got your group. And that's why Gimme My Mew came up. It came from that because I told them, I don't want to go to California. I want to stay in Alabama. 
Give me my mule, please. <laughs> wow. That's so cool to know the backstory to that after yeah. you know loving it for all these years like I have. I never get tired of hearing that. There are certain songs, if you really love them, a lot of times you just don't get tired of hearing them. You know, Other That's ones right. you kind of get tired of, but I yep. can never get tired of that groove. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah. It, wow. Um, it reminded me of the kind of stuff, too, that was coming out of Motown around that same time, like Shaky Ground by The uh, Temptations. You know, just yeah. that real super slow, down, thick funk groove. Yeah, yeah. And that, uh, was, uh, that was one of my observations. All of the Commodore's music, if you listen to it in context with the songs that they were competing with at that time, Commodore's music was always a little bit slower. Their funk was just a little bit slower, different. It had to give you time to wrap your, your mind around it, you know? And, and uh, everybody said, speed it up, speed it up. I said, no, 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 no. This is where it should be, right here, right here. And we would sit in that pocket and it would just, just mesmerize you. What, what would the process typically be for a funk track like that? Would it be that, you know, you'd lay the bass and drums first or what? How would it be, you know, assembled? In those, in those days, in those days, they cut the whole rhythm section at the same time. The drums, the bass, the keyboard. And the guitar, they would cut that at the same time. And uh, that's why sometimes it took a long time for everybody to get in sync. And then we play it. And after that, we go come back and do all the sweetening. You know, we, we, we put all the things on top. The, the rhythm track was cut simultaneously, all four of us. Yeah, I think it makes a difference with that chemistry, that, you know, interpersonal human connection being yeah. part of it right yeah that is uh that is the thing that is the thing why i say bands in our time would it would be difficult for them to play a groove the same all the way through because you got four different people and they all got four different ideas and when one gets inspired and he changes something it affects the other person so Music is always revolving, you know, it's always going to something else. It's hard to stay in one place. Yep. Yeah, it's that organic thing. Um, yeah. And uh, I remember back then too, Ronald, that um, I don't know if the group came up with it or it was something that the label did or whatever, but I remember saying that the Commodores are aspiring to be like the Black Beatles, you know? We went to we went to introduce ourselves to Manila, Philippines. And uh, the manager booked the show and said, we're going to go down. And uh, because we had only had one album, uh, that was Machine Gun album. We put the Machine Gun album out. We went down to do some shows to show the people who we were and that. When we got to the Philippines at the airport, there were 90,000 people there in the lobby to meet the Commodores. Uh, when they were playing, they were playing all of the songs from the Machine Gun album on all 24 of the radio stations in the Philippines. They played all 10 of the songs. And, and uh, so when we got there, we couldn't go any place. It was, it was like the Jackson 5 were in town, you know, and we were just the Commodores. We had one song. We didn't know. We were straight from Alabama. We had no idea. But we went. There were, we had friends who were in the Army in the Philippines, and McClary and myself went to one of our friends' house for dinner, and he told his next-door neighbor the two of the Commodores are coming to his house. We got there. And then they had to bring the military police to get us out. Everyone in the neighborhood was there. I mean, they were banging on the doors and hitting on the windows and things. I mean, 20, 30,000 people outside of his house. So they said, okay, we are going to do a concert at the Araneta Coliseum. Just spur them on, we'll do a concert. 
we put that on radio. Two and a half hours later, we had sold six shows of 80,000 people. We did six shows there. Beatles did that, and they sold four shows. So we said we want to be bigger than the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow, you guys must have been just disbelief. Yeah, it would. I mean, coming from Tuskegee, where there's eight thousand people, and uh, then going to Philippines, where there's Six shows of 80,000 people coming. I mean, an hour another Coliseum had like five tiers. It was like the Superdome in New Orleans. Huge building, huge building. And on the very top, on the very top echelon, there was one boy from the stage. He looked like he was about two inches tall. He was so far away. And he was dancing on the rafter. With, when we started playing Machine Gun. I mean, it just tore the place up. It was wow. something. You know? Do you know if any footage exists of any of that? I'm, I'm sure uh, Victor Del Rosario, who works, who was dis distributing the music in the Philippines, I'm sure they got lots of film of it. I'm sure they had lots of film of it, yeah. Wow. So uh, after that, it was sort of all, you can only go downhill uh, from there, from that, at mm. least in that country, but you can try mm. to aspire to the same type of thing in America, I guess. Mm. Yeah, we would, we were trying, we were trying to, we were trying to be concert tour. You know, we would try to do that rather than, rather than, rather than than going and and doing a stint in a in a place like we would go to Atlantic City we get to Atlantic City and we would stay in Atlantic City for 3 weeks and like a casino and people coming and going people coming and going we wanted to try to get everyone there on the same day rather than staying there for 3 weeks you know so uh we were we were always dreaming, you know, we were always dreaming. There's much more to this great Truth and Rhythm interview. Just continue on to the next part of the episode. Also, be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. And become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinstuff.net. Thank you very much.